All right. Well, let me just say this from the beginning. Um, I really thought when I started to teach the book of Revelation that there might be about 10 of us left in the room. <laughs> so thanks for sticking around. Um, I, I, to be honest, I really in one way didn't want to teach the book of Revelation because it's so intimidating. Um, but on another level, it, it has been such a massive encouragement to me, and I hope it's been an encouragement to you just as we've, as we've gone through it and kind of understood it maybe from a different, a different way. But one of the things that we've been trying to do is to look at the book of Revelation from the standpoint, I would say this, of just of a grander picture, which is this, as we read through it, the promise of the book of Revelation is that you'll be blessed as you read through it and as you obey the words that are within it. That the goal of John writing this, that the reason the Holy Spirit empowered him and led him along to write this book is so that by the time we get done reading it and reading it and reading it and studying it together and looking at it is that you will be blessed. And the way that we talked about this word blessed is, is like authentic, true joy, authentic, true happiness, that not that fake stuff that kind of comes and goes, but that real stuff that sustains us and builds in us so that we might, might truly find contentment and satisfaction in life. Now, as we've gone through it, let's be honest, we've read certain things that don't seem very joyful, right? You're reading it going, oh my gosh. And today, we're going to read about a woman. We're going to read about a beast. We're going to read about a dragon. We're going to read about all these things that on one level, again, it can seem as if you're sitting there wondering, where is the joy in the midst of this? Now, the joy of this book is that not only is King Jesus the one who reigns, and he will be victorious, and every week I've tried to champion that theme of the, the victory of Jesus, but each story, if you look behind me, that represents, is represented in all these pictures is telling the story of people that haven't just experienced the victory of Jesus from the standpoint of a future event, but we really believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus was so powerful that we can experience victory today in our lives. Now, Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, even said this to him. He said, look, you know, therefore, if there's anyone in Christ, anyone, if there's anyone in Christ, he is a new creation. He says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In other words, those of us that came to know Jesus, that embraced him by faith, it's not just that we have future victory, but listen to me, right now, we can become the people that God intends us to be. It isn't just that he has a future hope for us. He's going to change us now. And, and that's why in 1 John, when he's talking to us in, in chapter 5, he tells us, and this word overcome is all throughout, or the, book of, the idea of conquer is all throughout the book of Revelation. He says, look, anyone that's been born of God, he overcomes. He conquers the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Your faith. And it's not just faith in a concept, but now it's faithfulness now. We talked about this last week, that we can be empowered to be the people that God wants us to be. This is the promise of the new covenant, not just a future thing. And I feel like people, when they read Revelation, all they think about is, okay, great. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. And finally, when he comes back, he's going to set all things straight, which, by the way, phenomenal thing. But he is setting things straight right now. Not only in others' lives, but he's wanting to do it in our lives. Now, what we tried to do is we've been looking at the book of Revelation. These are the seven hooks or the kind of the, the, the way that we're looking at the box top of a puzzle. And, and kind of the, the two key areas that we're going to look at today is we're gonna, he's going to reveal something. So that's what apocalypse means. But he's going to reveal something about an expectation on us. Okay, this is going to be important. He's going to tell us something about God, but the expectation is, is that we will become the different people that God intended. Now, one of the key things to look at in this, though, is that the way he's going to do it is he's going to do it through this battle that's going on. Now, people may not realize it or not, but right now we are in the midst of a battle, and it's happening all around us. And the way the Bible describes it is in Ephesians 6, he says, listen to me, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, just stop for a second. Whoa. Therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God, which he explains from chapter, verse 14 on, watch this, that you may be able to stand in the evil day and have done all to stand firm. Now, if there's one thing that I hope we gather from this today, 
is that the book of Revelation teaches us that those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ in here, the way that the Spirit of God is going to empower us is he's going to empower us to be people that stand firm. So many people, I feel like, that study the book of Revelation, they're like, what's this, and this is that, and this is, they're all over the place and freaking out about all the different things that are going on. No, the book of Revelation teaches us to stand firm and be solid. It's meant to give us this this standpoint in which we trust so greatly in this gigantic God who has a plan that he will remain firm and won't complete it until he is absolutely finished. You can have faith and hold solid to him. And in a world that seems so topsy-turvy, you can stand firm. The book of Revelation is here to teach us that. Now, this battle that we are talking about, though, and we need to kind of find our place in the story, The battle that we're talking about started all the way back at the Garden of Eden. And in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, in verse 15, it talks about this battle. When when Adam and Eve had sinned and there was that snake, we know that old evil serpent that was in there that had tempted him, there was a curse that God was going to bring down on him. And here's what he says to this particular, to this serpent or to Satan. He says, I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to put war between you, and he says this, and the woman between your offspring, those that will come from you, or the one that will come from you, and her offspring, those that will come from her, and, or else the one that will come from her. Now watch this. He is going to bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It was all foretelling about the day that Jesus Christ was going to come, he was going to be buried, or he's going to die, be buried, and he was going to rise from the dead, and this was going to crush the serpent. Now, in this story, though, we got to kind of wrap our mind around it because we're going to see, when we get to the book of Revelation, a snake or a dragon. We're going to see a woman. We're going to see these people that are the offspring. We're going to see the offspring. But we have to understand that this battle began all the way back here, and we have to understand it because everything is moving. What God said he was going to do, he's going to accomplish. Now, that offspring is important because we understand that in, in, in Genesis 11:4 that the offspring that came along were going to be this group of people that would eventually build this high tower, and they were going to, you can see up there in verse 4, make a name for themselves. This is key. All of those that are the offspring we're going to find of Satan are wanting to make a name for themselves. That's kind of the core of it. Now, John talks about them later in, in John uh, 8, 44, excuse me, Jesus does, when he's explaining there are these people that are the offspring of Satan. Now, this, this kind of sounds bad, but listen, let me let Jesus explain it. He's talking to these religious leaders, and he says, you're of your father, the devil. Now, can you imagine if I walked in and I said, you're of your father, the devil? You'd be like, he squeezed me? I mean, he's like, what? Jesus was to the point. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Again, this is alluding all the way back to Genesis 3.15. There were going to be groups of people that were going to be from the line of Satan. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth. Why do you not believe in me? He says, as whoever's of God hears the words of God, this is going to now be the offspring of the woman we're going to talk about. And the reason why you don't hear them is that you're not of God. He's laying out two separate groups of people. There are those that listen to God, and there's those who do not listen to God. He's trying to convey this because it's going to build towards revelation. Now, later on in 1 John, he clarifies this. And these ones now that obey God, he says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now, just stop for a second. For those of you in here that know Jesus, I love this passage because what it teaches is is that we are not perfect, but it's not about perfection. It's about the practice of our lives. I can know that I'm a follower of Jesus, or I can know that I'm a child of Satan, which is scary to think about, by how it is that I practice my life. In other words, as God changes me, I start to see evidence. Now, last week, we brought in the idea of Samson. He wasn't perfect, but in the end, it panned out. We saw who he was. He goes on. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. In other words, this is of the offspring of Satan. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared, look at this, was to destroy the works of the devil. 
Jesus came to work against this, and now he's going to tell us no one born of God is going to make this practice of sinning. So this is really important in understanding this, and we've, we've got to wrap our minds around this before we get into the book of Revelation, is that there are two groups of people that we're going to be talking about. One that's obedient to God, that follows his commandments, not perfectly, and another that follows now the commandments of Satan or follows after him. There's just two groups of people. Now, the reason that I think like we can talk about this idea of perfection not being there, because John initially says to them, look, I'm writing these things so that you might not sin. But look at this. If anyone does sin, the point is we will sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation. In other words, an atoning sacrificer, one who pairs the consequences of our sin, what we sang about in that song, that turns away the wrath of the Father for our sins, um, for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the world. Now watch this, though. It's not just a salvation of faith alone, but faith now that not is by works, but look at this, works. By this we may know that we're in him. Whoever says he abides in him, that being Jesus, ought to walk in the same way he walked. If you really want to know if you're saved or not, you will see it by evidence in your life. I I hope I've made my argument here. There is a reality of those that have come to know Jesus that our lives will be transformed, not perfect, but we will be made different. Now, when we come to Revelation, and this is what's important, we have a woman, we have a serpent, we have offspring, we have Jesus, we've got Satan, we've got all these different things going on. And now watch what happens. Open up your Bibles if you got them to Revelation 12. And I'm just going to walk us through this can we, so we can kind of see this, this great battle or these, these two ways in which people pan out. It says there was a great sign or just something that represents a, a reality. That's all a sign is. He's, he's going to tell us that this is, there's something happened here. And it appeared in heaven. Now watch this. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, on some level, we sit there and go, okay, this is a weird sign. What does it represent? If you look at this idea of a sun and you look at this idea of a moon and stars, it probably points all the way back to Genesis 37 and the the vision that that Joseph had, but in which Israel became known as the woman. Now, watch this. He's telling us that the symbol here is Israel, and Israel is this one now as God's people that's representing the way by which now God is going to accomplish his plan. There's this way in which God's people or his are going to pan out in this way in which they're going to be represented by this this person, this woman who represents Israel. Now watch. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Giving birth to who? Well, what we're going to find out later is he's giving, she's giving birth to the Messiah. It's, just this, it's telling us the story of Israel and how Israel went through all kinds of difficulties. And in going through these different difficulties, it was all about bringing to us this child, Jesus Christ. But along with her going through all these travails to get this to this particular point... There was another sign that appeared in heaven, and behold, he says, a great red dragon, which later in verse 9, we're going to find out is Satan, and look at this. He had seven heads, the epitome of evil, and ten horns, meaning power beyond anything that we can imagine, and on his head, seven diadems, authority, and his tail swept down a third of the stars, which we're going to learn later is just demons that come with him, and cast them to earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who's about to give birth, so that when she bore the child, child, he might devour it. Whoa. Now again, symbol. What it's trying to show is that there's a real evil one who has been working his plan and his purpose to try to stop what God's doing. And the idea of him sitting there, if you've ever seen like a wild animal kind of shows before, is that the, the lion will be sitting there waiting for the, you know, whatever beast of prey is out there that gives birth to the little child. And the lion sweeps in and kills it. And that's the image is that Satan is waiting literally for the coming of this Messiah. We're going to learn a little bit later. And he's going to now sit there in the hopes with his jaws open to stop the plan of God. You with me? Okay, all right. Now in verse 5, she finally gives birth to a male child. Jesus comes. And the one who says, and this is why we know it's the Messiah, who's to rule all the nations with a rod iron, but look at this. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, whoa, fast forward. 
What just happened? The reality that he's showing is, is that while Satan was there to try to stop and thwart the plan of God, is that somehow through what Satan did, actually he began to usher in the plan of God. Now what was that? Well, we find out kind of all throughout, scattered through the book of Revelation, is that this idea of Satan seeking to thwart the plan of God, but Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, and then his ascension to the throne, he actually used everything that was Satan was doing to actually get to his throne. So in other words, what is this talking about? Our God is superseding all things, and even though Satan thinks he's stopping the plan of God, you can't stop the plan of God. In fact, through what Satan does, Jesus becomes enthroned. He's sitting there on his throne. Now, upset about this, after being caught up, the woman fled to the wilderness. In other words, she began to run away. The way that I think the New Testament speaks of it is Israel just begins to scatter. Where she has a place, look at this, prepared by God, meaning God knew this was going to happen, in which she's to be nourished for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Now, there's two things that are kind of key here. And I know I'm getting kind of technical, but just go with me. On one end is God protecting the Messiah and his plan. There is nothing that's going to stop Jesus' kingdom. There is nothing that's going to stop him from accomplishing his purpose. There is nothing whatsoever, and everything that Satan does actually only continues to accomplish God's plan. There's another group over here called Israel that ultimately Satan tries to get to them, but in the end of it, God not only preserves his son, but he preserves his people Israel. God's not done with Israel yet. He's telling this story. So what happened? How did he get caught up? I'm glad you asked because in verse 7 now, he's going to tell us. He's going to go back in there. He's going to explain to him him something. He says, there was this war that arose in heaven. Now, what was that like? Michael and his angels, which we find out Michael's a pretty big angel, and his angels are fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fight back. All the while, what he's saying is, is while Jesus Christ is going through everything that's accomplishing on earth, we see that he is dying, that he's being buried, and that he rose again. But in the angelic realm, he takes us there, and here is this grand battle between the forces of God and the angels that are led by Michael and the forces of the evil one, which are led by the angelic realm that's with him. But, and here's the key, he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for him in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels, here's connection back to verse four with those stars that he took with him. They were thrown down with him. On one level, you kind of hear this. You're like, man, this sounds Hollywood to me. Now we're going to get to the point in a little bit, but this is what's going on between what's happening on earth and what's happening in heaven. It explains a little further and it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying this, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, his Messiah, have come, that that male child that was born. But look at this, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. His point of what he's saying is is that Satan used to have a place, and we kind of see this in the book of Job, where he used to accuse the people of God. But the moment that Jesus Christ ascended to the throne, John 2 tells us he becomes the propitiation for us. He's the one that when we're sinning, constantly cries out to God because of his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. This is one of mine. And that's why the book of Hebrews says we can boldly approach the throne of grace because this plan that Satan had to thwart it that actually arrived at this idea of Jesus being in the throne, he now lives every day and he gives us now access to the Father. Satan and his minions were thrown to the ground. Now watch this. And they were conquered, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. His death made it where Satan no longer could accuse us. He could no longer stand before the throne and by the word of their testimony, which we're going to come to later, for they have loved not their own lives unto death. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But look at this. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Now stop. He gets done and he's like, heaven, everybody rejoice. 
And I'm sure all heaven was going, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead. The witch. They're like, yes, heaven has been free. And they sit there in this glorious, just like, no way. No longer is Satan in any way accusing the brethren because of the work of Jesus. But watch this. But. Oh, woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. No longer now able to accuse the brethren in heaven. He now, the, the, he talks about, is cast to earth in which now he is going to go after the earth. Now, on one level, those of us on the earth say, you can keep him. No, it's totally cool. He's all yours. We'll just stay on here. But he was already deceiving in different ways on this earth. But now he's going to come. And the idea is his wrath. He is mad because he knows that there's only going to be a short time on this earth that he's going to be able to have to be able to deceive people. It's just a tiny bit amount. But he is going to do everything that he can do to deceive them. He's going to persecute. He's going to blaspheme God. He's going to go all out. But listen to me. The great serpent... Satan, through the work of Jesus, was delivered the death blow. It's like an animal that gets shot that's angry and flailing, but his time is short. So how is he going to do it? Chapter 13 comes along, and it says this is how he's going to do it. And he tells the story of this beast that comes up. Now, again, here's Satan, and he's standing there on the shores. We learned that from the last verse. And he's wondering what to do. And it says in the first thing he does is he looks out at the sea, and he begins to now, oh, wait, I had one more thing to do. Fire, sorry, we're coming back to 13. Don't go to chapter 13 yet. If you're turning to 13, go back to chapter 12, verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, watch this, he went after the woman who'd been given birth to the male child. But the woman, look at this, was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent. In other words, this is the way God would rescue them into the wilderness, that place where she is to be nourished for time, times, and half a time. I think this just means God's not done with Israel yet. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But earth came and, and helped of the woman and the earth opened up its mouth, swallowed the river so that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. In other words, God is gonna care for Israel. Verse 17, but when the dragon couldn't get her, he became furious with the woman and look at this. He now went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who are they? They are the ones who keep the test commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And it says he stood on the sands of the sea. Now he's just telling this story, God's work in which he, he, he was seeking to accuse the brethren. God cast him out through the work of Jesus and casting him out. First he goes after Israel. We see that in like what happens in AD 70, which I've talked about a lot. But now Satan is after the church. Now just listen to me. If you want to know what Satan is after, he's after us. Remember the Bible talks about that Satan is a roaring lion, what? Seeking whom he may devour. The Bible always speaks of Satan as real. That's what Paul said, we're in a battle that's going on right now. The question is, what does that battle look like? And he sits there, and there he is standing on the sand of the sea, and now you're going to see how he's going to go after the church. Now watch this in verse 1 of chapter 13. I saw this beast, he says, rising out of the sea with ten horns, that just means power, and seven heads, which means evil, evilness, and ten diadems, authority, with these horns, and he began to be blasphemous out of these heads. There are these names that are on it that are just blasphemous. And the beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The way that he's describing it is back in the book of Daniel. If remember when we taught there, all these different kingdoms. He's, he's trying to describe kingdoms that were coming. But look at this. He describes him this way. And the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Now, in Daniel, when we speak of all those kingdoms, some of them were Persia, some of them were Rome, some of them were different kingdoms that had come along. Now, all of a sudden, the way he sees them is kingdoms all kind of compacted together in this one great kingdom. We believe that it's a future event that's going to come in which there will be a worldwide government of some sort that's going to literally start to persecute the church. Now, just think about that. How is Satan going to come? The way that it's going to look is there are going to be 
government established in some way to come after them. He goes on and it says, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Now that wound that we talk about is found in, in Isaiah 27 where it talks about this wound that would be delivered to the serpent. But this beast who's the proxy, if you go back to this, is the one who's going to bear it. And somehow in some way this mortal wound was going to be healed and the whole world now is going to marvel at this beast and be like, no way. He must be phenomenal. He must be incredible. He must be powerful. And look at this. And they worshiped the dragon for he had, who had given him this authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? There's a time coming and I think there's been times along the way in which literally this is something that's going to happen and the whole world is going to be blown away by it. Some of us sit there again and go, come on, this is Hollywood stuff. I'm going to prove it to you here in just a little bit. With it now we know that in that day, oops, excuse me, that the beast was given a mouth and he began to utter haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. In other words, three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemous blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. In other words, God allows this to happen, which I can't imagine why, but here's God allowing it to happen. It was also allowed, look at this, not just to seek to deceive, but here's the second kind of two-pronged attack that he's going to come at it. He was allowed to make war on the saints and conquer them. In other words, he's allowed to persecute the saints. Now just, again, stop for a second. Not only is there going to be this worldwide way in which he's seeking to deceive a whole world, but now the, literally the beast is going to turn and he's going to start persecuting the saints. And again, you're sitting there going, dude, where's the joy? I'm looking for the joy. Where's the joy? And authority was given over every tribe and people and language. This is what I mean in nation. It's worldwide. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, except for those whose names, especially those whose names have been written for the foundation of the world, that it's not in this particular book. Verse 9, and you can go back and listen to this from uh, last week. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. If anyone's to be taken captive, that is Christians, to captivity he goes. If anyone's to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call to endurance and faith of the saints. Where's the joy? We're looking at this event. It's cosmic in nature. It's going after the church. And here's this beast who's orchestrating all things, empowered by this evil one. And I would just say this. This is what I think we're preparing the church to walk through. Now, whether you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, a mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation rapture, it's just this idea that literally we're preparing the church so that we might be these ones who endure and have the faith of the saints. Gathering together of saints is not a game. What we're doing right now is not a game. What we're doing right now in hearing the word of God and be challenged by the word of God and singing these songs is to make sure that we understand that we are in the midst of this cosmic battle that's going on. And again, whether you believe this has happened, is happening, or will happen, we're in the midst of this thing that is not a game and we have to be prepared to endure. We have to be prepared to have faith. The other night when I was praying over my children, I started to realize I'm not just praying for anything. I'm praying for kids that are beginning to learn that walking through this life is brutal. There's a real Satan. And no longer am I sitting there like I'm talking to God going, hey God, could you provide my kids some chips and some sodas and some hot dogs and Cracker Jacks would be good too. I'm crying out to a God saying, God, there's a battle going on. Prepare my kids for the battle. It's real. Now in this battle, we learn in verse 11, another beast that rises out of the earth. It had two horns, it says, like a lamb. It's kind of, kind of trying to be a cheap duplicate of Jesus. It, it has power, and it spoke like a dragon. It had authority of the first beast, and it's present. It makes, on the earth, it, it, its inhabitants, it makes them worship the beast. In other words, this is a false prophet we're going to learn about later whose mortal wound was healed. In other words, he's, he's talking about, see this, this one who's, who's been healed, nothing can kill him, this beast is incredible. 
And it performs great signs, even making the fire come down from heaven. The idea is, is it's going back to the Old Testament. All the amazing things that God did through Moses and Aaron and Elijah and Elisha, it can do too. And by the signs that it's allowed to work, and again, there's the key allowed, and the presence of the beast that deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. What's going on here? If the first part was back here in kingdoms, now all of a sudden we're taking religion and kingdoms and putting them together, and it's this nasty mix in which now God is allowing Satan to go after the world to deceive them. Verse 16, also it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, again, where's the joy? we got to be getting to the joy, Todd. You've been speaking now for half an hour, bro. Get there. Before I get there, though, we have to understand what's going on. Now, there's so many people that are afraid of, like, getting a tattoo or, like, a a, a chip in their head or a chip in their, their wrist or a tattoo on their wrist. I don't think that's what he's saying here. He's talking about the fact that one day there's going to be groups of people that are going to have an allegiance to this particular beast. Now, remember I told you I was going to prove to you that this could happen. In the early 20th century, right after World War I in Germany, a young man began to rise to power. The particular young man's name was Adolf Hitler. As he began to rise to power, one of the things that he was trying to tell people is, is that I realized that based upon the Treaty of Versailles and based upon just the stuff that's going on in our world, I realized that it looks like Germany is not great and we, we can be great. He began to go after young people, disenfranchised people, people that had lost their jobs. And he began to tell them, I have a plan for you. I have a way that I'm going to work all of this out. And groups of people begin to throng to him and begin to tell him how wonderful he really was. We know that by the early 30s, he was starting to establish power, and by the mid-30s, he had, ar- he had arisen to the very place of absolute authority within the land of Germany. Just a few short years. Upon arriving there, we know what he did next. He began to gather people behind him where they called him Der Führer. They began to raise their hand in a salute to him. They began to wear round things upon their arms to begin to have a mark that says, Der Führer, the one that we are following is him. Hail the Führer. He's the one. And they begin to take different marks and symbols to say, our allegiance is to that man. All the while, he was dragging them down in a way that they didn't even know. And in fact, it got to the point where they even started to worship him. Most people don't know this, though, that one of the ways that he climbed to power was actually through the church. I've been forgetting to do my slides. Shoot. Oops, there he is. That man that's up there, his name was Mueller. In 1933, Hitler came to Mueller, who was a pastor within the German National Church. He convinced him that the state religion of Germany should be the Nazi religion, and he began to then convince this Mueller guy as to become the head of the the Nazi church, and in that he rose to power, even to the point finally, where this man who calls himself a pastor of Jesus Christ stood out in front of the church while Hitler was there and said der Fuhrer and began to raise his hand to him. A pastor. But it wasn't just the the Christian church, it was also the Catholic church. There's pictures of priests holding their hands up and in essence saying, our allegiance is to Hitler. The way that Hitler rose to power was through groups of people, not only within government, but he went after religion. It was a two-pronged attack. If you don't think this can happen in the future, just go back and realize it has happened before. Now, here comes the good news. Remember I told you joy. Into this story, though, becomes a man named Niemuller. At the very beginning, he was kind of the head of the German church, and he began to not do anything. In fact, he wrote a poem later on in his life where he talked about this idea, while socialists were being drug away, I basically did nothing. While trade uh, loyalists were being drug away, I did nothing. While the Jews were being drug away, basically I did nothing. And then he said, finally, I was drug away, and nobody did anything. 
He realized that there was a battle going on. And finally, in 1933, a group of 3,000 pastors stood up against the church and against Hitler. And they said, we will not worship in any kind of way the fewer. In fact, the only one that we'll worship is Jesus Christ. Now, again, you're like, where's the good news? For seven years, he spent time inside of concentration camps going from one to the other. Another man named Karl Barth began to write what was called the Barman Declaration, in which they told Hitler and they told the church, we will not go there. He was kicked out of the country. And probably the most famous was a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood as well with them and said, I will not go with you. And he ended in 1945, dying by execution. Where's the good news? The good news doesn't come till the end. I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had, who had his name and his father's names, look at this, written on their heads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the three living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except these people. We, we talked about it, the people of God who had been redeemed, look at this, from the earth. All these people that had ever stood against these things that, was, that were stacked against them were, like in Hitler's case, that was trying to make Germany great again. He was, he was trying to somehow in some way say, Germany can be great again. We will make a name for ourselves. These people that stood up against them in a powerful and a beautiful way, he says, one day you will not regret it when Jesus Christ comes back. You won't regret standing. You won't regret taking a stand against anything that comes our way. Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming back and he is going to set all things straight. Sometimes I feel like Christians sit there and they worry. You know, I feel like this is getting away with it and this person's getting away with it. Now watch, nobody's getting away with anything. He says, these ones that are there, it's these ones who have not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. In other words, they haven't gone down the sex route. In other words, he says, they're these ones that follow the lamb wherever he goes. They're not following Hitler or any form of government. They're following Jesus. These have been redeemed for mankind as the first fruits of God and the lamb. And in their mouth, they wouldn't, no lie was found. Again, not perfection, but the idea is blamelessness. He says, then I saw this angel that begins to fly overhead and in, in, in internal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth and in every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, only fear God, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Then another angel, almost in a flyby of victory, says this, fallen, fallen is Babylon, which we'll, we'll learn over the next few weeks, the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Here comes another angel. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also, look at this, will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Nobody gets away with anything. I was watching a documentary last week in which a man was so angry that Hitler committed suicide. He said, I wanted him to be tried in the Hague. He got out the easy way. Let me tell you something. Hitler got out of nothing. There is one day, according to this, and I don't even understand it fully, but I think he's got a unique wrath in store for him one day in which there will be justice and it will come in such a way that those of us that sometimes wonder, God, where are you? Where's your justice? What's going on? One day the judge will come and all things will be finalized. Now just look at that though in 11 and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Nobody's getting away with anything. All those that don't follow King Jesus, that don't make their allegiance to him, though, and this is why, let me just come back to all of you that, may, that don't know Jesus. Please hear me. 
You don't bend your knee to Jesus now. You will bend it one day except in horror and agony and pain. Jesus Christ came to rescue us. Remember, that's what we talked about earlier. Salvation has come today. Salvation in the proclamation of King Jesus. He, does, he doesn't deny the fact that we bend our knee to him, but in bending our knee to him, what he's saying to us is, is you are truly one of mine. And on the back end of that, the beauty was, is that he writes this, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Here's my good news. This is great news. He says, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. There will come a day for those of us that know Jesus that we will stand before him later in the book of Revelation 12 tells us and he will open the book of life and all of you whose names are written in it will enter in to what he calls this rest from their labors. Not the smoking sulfur that burns forever and ever, but an eternal rest to enjoy him in the way that he's promised. But look at the last part of it. For their deeds follow them. What you do right now matters. At Cornerstone, we do not teach that there is a salvation by works, but we believe the salvation we have works. Some way that he talks about it, these deeds following him, is that all these things that we've done in following Jesus to bring honor and glory to him will follow us into the judgment seat of Christ and our name will be written there and we won't sit around and pat ourselves in the back and go, man, I did good. In fact, we will understand Ephesians 2.10 for the first time. We have his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. All those good works that we bring in are evidence only of the fact that God saved us, redeemed us, made us one of his. In other words, if you don't have deeds in your life that demonstrate that you're a follower of Jesus, not perfection, but deeds, you should ask the question, am I really a follower of Jesus or am I just playing a game? Again, not salvation by works. Hear me. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works. You can't earn your way to heaven, but don't you dare think you're a follower of Jesus and you don't have the transformed life to show it. It's important. That's why he says it's a call for endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. He says, then I looked and behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a, a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour of reaping has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. In other words, you go back and you get all of the Christians was the idea. Go gather them in. So he sat on the cloud and swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. He went and got his own. But watch this. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who had authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had a sharp sickle, put your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest and the earth, and watch this, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Woo! Remember I said to you earlier, this is not a game. It causes us to be serious. I sat down with a guy this week that doesn't know Jesus. I pled with him. I said, listen, this is what I'm studying about to get ready to teach the people at my church. And I said, you got to understand, 
You don't bend your knee. And again, it's, I'm not trying to be hellfire brimstone by, you know, turn or burn or anything like that. I, I do believe there's so much joy to following Jesus. But there's also so much warning within the Bible. Don't mess with this God. Earlier, Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century preached again, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You don't want to follow into him. Where right now, he is begging and pleading for people to come to him. Come now. Come experience my joy. Come experience my grace and my mercy. Come experience hope in the work of Jesus Christ because there will come a time where the death of Jesus Christ will no longer cover humanity and his judgment will land and people will suffer for eternity at the hands of a wrath of God and in a weird way that will bring glory to him. I know it sounds weird, but if you don't bend your knee now, you will bend it later and you do not want to do that. If you don't know Jesus, today's the day. And I told this guy that. See, I know, I, I get what you're trying to say, but I just don't even think it's true. And oh, my prayer for him is that he doesn't learn in the wrong way one day that it is true. See, it causes a church to plead with people, doesn't it? We're not pleading with people, hey, you know, come to Jesus, live your best life now, it's awesome. No, it's not. There's suffering and persecution and difficulty. Come to Jesus because I'll tell you what, it's the most wonderful thing. And you know, even if it's not true, you've sure lived a good life. Skip that. If there's no death, burial, and resurrection, that means there's no heaven. I don't want to do this anymore. We bend our knee because we believe there's not only hope now, but there's greater hope in the future. We bend our knee now because we believe you do not want to fall into the hands of that God that is bringing wrath upon those that do not in any way believe him. And I saw what appeared to be a great sea of glass mingled with fire. And all those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its names standing besides the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. It's a reference back to Exodus 15. And the song of the Lamb saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty, not the beast. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now stop. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to sing this song one day. <laughs> Anybody else starting to find joy? That's our song. Billy doesn't even realize it, but he's not even singing our songs every Sunday. <laughs> There's our song. That's the new song that we're going to sing. It's going to sound good, especially if you're like me and you're musically challenged, right? We're going to sing this song together. One day, Jesus is coming back. I promise it. And there's your song. You might as well learn it now because we're going to sing it for eternity. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to show a video here right now of a group of people, uh, the Fallons, and uh, I guess not a group of people, a couple, and uh, how it is that they experienced the victory of Christ in their life. In summer of 2015, I started getting these migraine headaches, and they were the pain was pretty bad, and we had we went to a couple of physicians for this and they had said they were migraines too. I could hear with every beat of my heart, I could hear fluid in my head um, and light and sound and anything um, made the pain worse. You were pretty much incapacitated and yeah. laying down the whole time. By 10 every day. At the time, I was traveling probably too much, and I remember coming home and not seeing the usual Leslie and up and about and being busy and was laying down, so I knew it, it had to be pretty painful to, to have her uh, incapacitated in that way for so long, uh, so repetitively, uh, for so many days, so many weeks really. So I know when I was out of town, I said, if this is still going on when I get back, we're going to go to the ER. Uh, 
the next day, and that's what we did. Uh, we were joined together by the doctor, and who said it's not good news, and it was a, a brain tumor. And at that point, I was pretty much kind of in shock and surprised, and it was kind of a, a lot all at once. The next thing you know, we were there by ourselves, seemed like eternity. Uh, with no more information, taking the, the worst into account that is probably cancer and uh, going down that path and uh, seemed like a small hospital we were in, yet they had a brain surgeon uh, on duty. Uh, so he came in and, and uh, he quickly, uh, I felt like, was speaking to us and, and, and God's grace was that this wasn't uh, cancer. I'm kind of going back to not leaving in God's hands and, and, and saying, hey, listen, let's, let's get another opinion here. Uh, this is brain surgery. <laughs> so, we, you know, you've got UCLA down the road, other uh, great hospitals down the road in LA. Let's get a second opinion. And uh, he quickly answered, uh, well, you don't have enough time for a second opinion. We need, we need to do this. Hey, Sam. So he was, he was very clear that we needed to do it. Hey, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> that won't come out. Anyway, he was very clear that we had to, to move quickly. We didn't have time for a, a second opinion. And, and that was just God speaking to, to us again and saying, this is in his control and he's got us and he's going to take care of this. And then you started to text your Bible study group. and yeah. they, they were very supportive. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that it was a, once the children were all together and Leslie was in the surgery, it was very uh, heartwarming and very helpful for the family to have uh, Terry Earwood and other people from the congregation come to the waiting room and, and pray with us. And it was a, a tearful moment, and, uh, but everybody came together and and knew that God's will was going to be done and it was going to be good. This week, a few weeks ago, sorry, my, my son and I and my wife and difference were reading through the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And as we're reading through it, my son starts asking question after question after question. It was so good. It's, if you haven't read the biographies of saints of the past, I highly encourage it. And he gets to this spot where Dr. Bonhoeffer is about ready to die. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and he said, Dad, what would you have done if you were Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Now, my quick answer is to say, I'm a holy man, son. But it stopped for a second. And I looked back at him and I said this to him. I said, Josiah, if we ever have to walk down that path, Jesus will be there with us. I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care if it's persecution. I don't care if it's a difficult marriage, rough parenting, loss of a job. The point of all this passage is we have a God that walks through it with us. And Leslie could have, by the will of God, been taken home. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. As followers of Jesus, we cannot lose. Blessed. So in the name of the Father who set out with a plan, and it was a plan that no one could stop. In the name of the son, who came as that male child and defeated the evil one, casting him to the earth, putting a scar upon his head that we're going to learn later, will one day learn in his, leave, learn to, leave to his demise. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who has sealed us and will make sure that all of us in here that are his will make it to the end. In the name of those three, God bless you this week as you go live with the confidence 
Jesus is walking with us. Amen? Amen. All right, God bless you.